Captain James B. Eads On the steamship Germanic, I played chess with the great civil engineer, Captain Eads, stimulated by the thought that to beat him was to defeat the man who had twice conquered the Mississippi. But I didn't defeat him. The building of a ship canal across the Isthmus of Suez made famous the Frenchman, Ferdinand de Lesseps. So the opening up of the mouth of the Mississippi River has distinguished Captain Eads. Today both these men are struggling for the rare honor of joining, at the Isthmus of Panama, the waters of the great Atlantic and Pacific, a magnificent scheme which, if successful, will save annually thousands of miles of dangerous sea voyage around Cape Horn, besides millions of money. The Great West seems to delight in producing self-made men like Lincoln, Grant, Eads, and others. James B. Eads was born in Indiana in 1820. He is slender in form, neat in dress, genial, courteous, and over sixty years of age. In 1833 his father started down the Ohio River with his family, proposing to settle in Wisconsin. The boat caught fire and his scanty furniture and clothing were burned. Young Eads barely escaped ashore with his pantaloons, shirt, and cap. Taking passage on another boat, this boy of thirteen landed at St. Louis with his parents, his little bare feet first touching the rocky shore of the city on the very spot where he afterwards located and built the largest steel bridge in the world, over the Mississippi, one of the most difficult feats of engineering ever performed in America. At the age of nine, young Eads made a short trip on the Ohio, when the engineer of the steamboat explained to him so clearly the construction of the steam engine, that before he was a year older he built a little working model of it, so perfect in its parts and movements, that his schoolmates would frequently go home with him after school to see it work. A locomotive engine driven by a concealed rat was one of his next juvenile feats in mechanical engineering. From eight to thirteen he attended school, after which, from necessity, he was placed as clerk in a dry goods store. How few young people of the many to whom poverty denies an education either understand the value of the saying, knowledge is power, or exercise will sufficient to overcome obstacles. Will power and thirst for knowledge elevated General Garfield from driving canal horses to the presidency of the United States. Over the store in St. Louis, where he was engaged, his employer lived. He was an old bachelor, and having observed the tastes of his clerk, gave him his first book in engineering. The old gentleman's library furnished evening companions for him during the five years he was thus employed. Finally, his health failing, at the age of nineteen, he went on a Mississippi River steamer, from which time to the present day that great river has been to him an all-absorbing study. Soon afterwards he formed a partnership with a friend, and built a small boat to raise cargoes of vessels sunken in the Mississippi. While this boat was building, he made his first venture in submarine engineering, on the lower rapids of the river, by the recovery of several hundred tons of lead. He hired a scow, or flatboat, and anchored it over the wreck. An experienced diver, clad in armor, who had been hired at considerable expense in Buffalo, was lowered into the water. But the rapids were so swift that the diver, though encased in the strong armor, feared to be sunk to the bottom. Young Eads determined to succeed, and finding it impracticable to use the armor, went ashore, purchased a whiskey barrel, knocked out the head, attached the air pump hose to it, fastened several heavy weights to the open end of the barrel, then, swinging it on a derrick, he had a practical diving bell, the best use I ever heard made of a whiskey barrel. Neither the diver nor any of the crew would go down in this contrivance, so the dauntless young engineer, having full confidence in what he had read in books, was lowered within the barrel down to the bottom, the lower end of the barrel being open. The water was sixteen feet deep and very swift. Finding the wreck, he remained by it a full hour, hitching ropes to pig lead till a ton or more was safely hoisted into his own boat. Then, making a signal by a small line attached to the barrel, he was lifted on deck and in command again. The sunken cargo was soon successfully raised, and was sold, and netted a handsome profit, 
which, increased by other successes, enabled energetic Eads to build larger boats, with powerful pumps and machinery on them for lifting entire vessels. He surprised all his friends in floating even immense sunken steamers, boats which had long been given up as lost. When the rebellion came, it was soon evident that a strong fleet must be put upon western rivers to assist our armies. Word came from the government to Captain Eads to report in Washington. His thorough knowledge of the Father of Waters and its tributaries, and his practical suggestions, secured an order to build seven gunboats, and soon after an order for the eighth was given. In forty-eight hours after receiving this authority, his agents and assistants were at work, and suitable ship timber was felled in half a dozen western states for their hulls. Contracts were awarded to large engine and iron works in St. Louis, Pittsburgh, and Cincinnati, and within one hundred days eight powerful iron-clad gunboats, carrying over one hundred large cannon and costing a million dollars, were achieving victories no less important for the Mississippi Valley than those which Erickson's famous cheese-box monitor afterwards won on the James River. These eight gunboats Commodore Foote ably employed in his brave attacks on Forts McHenry and Donaldson. They were the first ironclads the United States ever owned. Captain Eads covered the boats with iron. Commodore Foote covered them with glory. Eads built not less than fourteen of these gunboats. During the war, the models were exhibited by request to the German and other governments. His next work was to throw across the mighty Mississippi River, nearly half a mile wide, at St. Louis, a monstrous steel bridge, supported by three arches, the spans of two being five hundred and two feet long, and the central one five hundred and twenty feet. The huge piles were ingeniously sunk in the treacherous sand, one hundred and thirty-six feet below the flood level, to the solid rock, through ninety feet of sand. This bridge and its approaches cost eighty millions of dollars, and is used by ten or twelve railroad companies. Above the tracks is a big street with carriage roads, street cars, and walks for foot passengers. The honor of building the finest bridge in the world would have satisfied most men, but not ambitious Captain Eads. He actually loved the noble river in which De Soto, its discoverer, was buried, and fully realized the vast, undeveloped resources of its rich valleys. Equally well, he understood what a gigantic work in the past the river and its fifteen hundred sizable tributaries had accomplished in times of freshets, by depositing soil and sand north of the original Gulf of Mexico, forming an alluvial plain five hundred miles long, sixty miles wide, and of unknown depth, and having a delta extending out into the Gulf sixty miles long and as many miles wide, and probably a mile deep. And yet this heroic man, although jealously opposed for years by West Point engineers, having a sublime confidence in the laws of nature, and actuated by intense desire to benefit mankind, dared to stand on the immense sandbars at the mouth of this defiant stream, and making use of the jetty system, bid the river itself dig a wide, deep channel into the seas beyond, for the world's commerce." Captain Eads, who had studied the improvements on the Danube, Moss, and other European rivers, observed that all rivers flow faster in their narrow channels, and carry along in the swift water sand, gravel, and even stones. This familiar law he applied at the south pass of the Mississippi River, where the waters, though deep above, escaped from the banks into the gulf and spread sediment far and wide. The water on the sandbars of the three principal passes varied from eight to thirteen feet in depth. Many vessels require twice the depth. Two piers, twelve hundred feet apart, were built from land's end a mile into the sea. They were made from willows, timber, gravel, concrete, and stone. Mattresses, a hundred feet long, from twenty-five to fifty feet wide, and two feet thick, were constructed from small willows placed at right angles and bound securely together. These were floated into position, and sunk with gravel, one mattress upon another, which the river soon filled with sand that firmly held them in their place. The top was finished with heavy concrete blocks to resist the waves. These piers are called jetties, and the swift, collected waters have already carried over five million cubic yards of sand into the deep gulf, and made a shipway over thirty feet deep. 
the five million dollars paid by the United States was little enough for so priceless a service. In June 1844, Captain Eads received the Albert Medal of the British Society of Arts, the first American upon whom this honor has been conferred. Before his great enterprise of the Tehuan Tepic Ship Railroad had been completed, he died at Nassau, New Providence, Bahama Islands, March 8, 1887, after a brief illness of pneumonia, at the age of 67. <laughs>